Praise the Lord. Good to see y'all tonight. We stand together. I would believe you come to worship the Lord tonight. It's good to be in His presence and sing together.
sacrifice of praise. Maybe it was a sacrifice for you just to be in this house tonight. I know all day long all I've been wanting to do is go to sleep, but I've never regretted one time coming into the house of God and worshiping Him. He is awesome, and, it, and His presence just has a way of refreshing you or giving you peace, giving you comfort or whatever it is that you need in the moment. Right now we're going to take this service to a time of prayer, and if you have any requests that you would like to make known, you can do that. Is there any needs you remember, my dad, who was away for Shark and Oyster up again? They released him two weeks ago, but last night we had him when he tried to spit on his legs, and he had to go do everything again. So pray for him that that will turn into anything. Anybody else have anything? Anybody else have anything? Brother Tom Arnold from West Point, his mother Brenda Prager passed away, so he asked me to pray for her strength and health for, for his family. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any requests? Okay, I know we need to continue to remember um, Steve and Noy are coming, and we also need to remember our community as we always do. If nobody else has anything they want to mention right now, we'll go ahead and make these known. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. Excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight, as you are. We're living in a time when it seems as though people are living in such fear that what they may come in contact with or that what might uh, transpire in the future, but seems as though a lot of people are just not looking to Jesus like they need to. And I'm, I for one am glad that I know him. Yes. Aren't, you, aren't you glad you know him? Yes. Man, I'm glad that I know him. I, I know with whom I need to put my trust. Amen? Amen. I'm glad I'm trusting. Man, I Seems as though I've come to more realizations in my days of knowing that I need to put 
more trust in Him. In everything in my life, in all aspects of my life, I, I would encourage you as well to learn to trust in Him more. And I, I, this is not my message tonight, but I just feel this. And I prayed before service, I prayed today, I prayed. Every time I pray, I pray for these services and the things, and not, not just for me, but I pray for you. I pray for all the ministry and all the missions. and uh, Because we are in the day that we need to come to the realization. We, to, we need to acknowledge and know, Sister Jamie, that we need to trust in God. Put more trust in Him than what we ever have before. And uh, more belief, more trust. Uh, I have chosen, and I, I felt like the Lord laid this on my heart. Uh, I texted the pastor early, earlier this week, or yeah, I guess it was earlier this week, and I asked him, "Do you sure you feel like teaching?" Because I, I worry about, you know, I'm, I worry about. It's not I wasn't fishing for time to preach or anything like that. I just wanted to make sure, you know, because we kind of team together and do some things. And he said, "Well, don't you just go ahead and preach Wednesday night?" In other words, what he was saying was, "I'm still not feeling that great." So. Uh, I'm glad to be able to fill in, yes. and no, I can't measure up, but I felt like the Lord had something in these scriptures today that I had been studying in Matthew's gospel, the 16th chapter, but that's not my text, but uh, I had been studying in those scriptures and, and I backed up. A little bit in my reading on in, in chapter 15 and that's where I'll take my text tonight Matthew the 15th chapter again at verse 21 <clears throat> uh, let's, let's start in verse 22 and behold a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy on me O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now we find that the scripture that Jesus had just got through uh, having discussions in the earlier chapter with the scribes and the Pharisees and talking to them about uh, different things and, and I won't go into all that about the washing of the hands, how they were nitpicking the disciples, how they didn't wash their hands before they ate bread. Well, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in cleaning up too, but uh, that was just something that, uh, you know, they were nitpicking and Jesus came back and, of course, you can go there and read it. He came back to them, well, you have done a whole lot worse than breaking the commandments of God, so on and so forth. But in this particular verses of Scripture, we find that Jesus is encountered and you won't find too many places in the word of God where Jesus talks directly to an individual that is not of a Jewish race and I'll explain that to you here in a little bit but here we find a woman out of the land of Canaan and if you'll, you know your Bible history you know that it was uh, the promised land of Canaan that uh, Abraham sent uh, Caleb and Joshua in and told them they were well able to take the land and uh, we can go back and read that. I don't want to do all the history. I don't have time for all that. But uh, we find this woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She was acknowledging, even though she was not of the Jewish uh, race. She was not uh, of the tribes of any tribe of, of the Jewish race of Israel. She acknowledged, you're the son of David. We know your lineage. 
know where, who you are. And she went on to tell him her problem. She said, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now, it didn't matter whether it was the daughter grievous vexed with the devil or if she had an ingrown toenail. It didn't matter. She had a problem. And the reason I, I've done that, the reason I said it that way is to let you know that it doesn't matter what the problem is. You see, she had a problem. Sometimes we have problems no matter how little or how small or how large or whatever the mediocre, whatever you might say, we have a problem. Sometimes we neglect to go to Jesus and admit who he is. You understand what I'm saying here? I'm trying not to confuse anybody. But she acknowledged him. Yes. This woman, this Canaanite woman, she said, have mercy on me. Now, why was she pleading with Jesus in such a way? Let's read on and you'll find out. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now this was what he was sent for at this time. Now, you'll understand it better as I go on in, in Scripture, but let me elaborate just a little bit on this. The woman came to him was not an Israelite. She had no Israelite blood in her at all. She was not even of the, the nation. She was a, what the Bible refers to her as a Gentile. Now, a Gentile is everything that is not an Israelite. You, if you don't have Jewish blood in you, you're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. She had no right. Let me put it this way. She had no right to ask Jesus for anything because she was not of that dimension of time yet. Let me read on. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, Help me. Now this woman, she had nowhere else to go. She had nowhere else to turn. She didn't know. She, she, she was totally out in the left field all alone. Had nowhere else. Nobody could help her. And yet Jesus was telling her, Basically, what he was saying is, your time is not yet. I cannot help you now. It's not your time for help. You're crying after something that cannot happen now. I was not sent, but just to the lost house of Israel. She was in a desperate situation. She had nowhere else to turn. She had no one to help her. There was no psychiatrist around to psychoanalyze her daughter. There was nobody there that could reach out and, and console her to help her. So she done the only thing that she knew to do. Said that she came and worshipped him. Saying, Lord, help me. Help me. You know, I 
been in situations and been in times in, in my life and and I know you have too that you just did not know where to turn, did not know what to do next. You didn't have any idea what the, the, the next day was going to bring. Seemed like it was ready to help you. And the only thing that this woman could think to do was to worship him. Was she, was it right for her to worship him, being a Gentile? You know, sometimes just because out of ignorance we do things that may not be cultured with everybody else. Everybody else may not think it's uh, such a great idea to leap for joy in the middle of a service. Yeah. Everybody might not think that it's such a wonderful thing uh, to get really loud during the ministering of the Word of God and shout, Hallelujah! But there's just something about worship yes. that changes the whole direction of everything. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that? Come on now. Amen. Every time that we humble ourselves and we begin to worship God with sincerity and hope, yes. things yes. begin to happen. Yes. Hearts begin to change. Yes. Spirit begin to move. Hallelujah. Yes, worship does change the situation. Yes. Woo. It was hopeless for her. She had nowhere else to turn. She had nobody to answer her prayer. She did not know. And even Jesus told her, it's not time yet. I, I only came to, to the house of Israel. It's not time for you miracles for the Gentiles yet. And all of a sudden, Jesus felt the power of worship come from her. Woo! Friend, let me tell you, if you're sick, if you're burdened, if you're down, if you're downcast, if you're depressed, if you're hurting, if you're, if whatever the situation may be, if you can only muster a little worship to Jesus, then he will answer your prayer. Everybody might say, well, that's an impossibility. You eat up with cancer, you'll never survive. That's an impossibility. Your, your life is a wreck. You're an, a, a, addicted to drugs. You're addicted to alcohol, tobacco. You're a, you're a hopeless case. But if that drug addict should somehow find in him a place of worship, it is all possible. There's nothing impossible for God. That's right. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. There's nothing God will not do for the people that will worship Him. That's right. That's right. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. My goodness. Mm. So the situation even gets works. In verse 26 he said but he answered and said it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Not only did he tell her it was not her time for miracles. Not only does he discourage her from ever getting any help he calls her a dog. saying, I'm not going to take the children's loaf of bread and throw it out to the dogs. You talk about being slapped in the face. That would have discouraged me enough, probably, to have got up, turned around, and walked away. And the majority of you would have too. After all that, 
and worshiping him and begging and pleading to him, knowing who he was, and him to tell him, tell you, oh, it's not your time yet. It cannot be. I'm just for the house of Israel right now. And then all of a sudden, lashes out with an insult and say, I cannot cast the children's bread unto a dog. Well, being the humble woman that she was, I was just amazed by how this woman was so humble. She knew who she was. Hey, when I, when I first came to God, I knew who I was. I was a drunk. I'd done drugs. I cursed. I'd done tobacco. Everything that the old devil had out there, I was doing it. I knew who I was when I first came to God. And a lot of people that I know that came to God after I did, I knew what they were. Mm -hmm. So when I did finally find an altar of prayer and I repented of all those things, I felt I'm just not worthy. I am not worthy to bow knee to such a great God. Woo! But this woman, she was not deterred. She was not, she was so desperate for her daughter to be delivered that she was willing to be insulted, pushed back, rejected, whatever it took. She was willing to get on her knees and worship and plead and beg for help. Sometimes we as individuals, men and women, amen, to get anywhere at all with God, sometimes uh, uh, we have to get on our knees and plead, oh God, help me. Help me. But there's also a lot of pride in men and women that they don't want to bow a knee. They want God to, to do a special a trip for them so they can they can they don't have to do anything humbly and meekly and, and crawl unto God in their on their hands and knees and worship Him. They expect God to do all the work. But I'm here to tell you, God expects people to bow down to him and worship him and love him and respect him and show them their, their humility. So we find that the woman said after he called her a dog and he wasn't going to cast his children's bread uh, to, to the dogs, verse 27, and she said, true, Lord. Well, I mean, what else could she say? She was nothing more than just a dog. She was not of the house of Israel. She was not of that selective group. She said, true, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith. Oh, my God. Yes. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Even though it was not the right dispensation of time. Even though it was not her time for a miracle. But because she came humbly before him. And worship him and admit it. Yes, I, I am a dog. Right, right. Yes, I am nobody. Right. Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you wholeheartedly. I do not deserve your mercy. Right. Oh, friend, when we get to that point, when we realize we don't deserve God's mercy, whoo, that's when we're getting somewhere, when we're realizing, hey, I, I, I don't deserve your mercy, God. But because you decided to have mercy on me, I worship you. Yes, amen. 
Oh, friend, we need to understand, and I know I have in my own mind as, as God talked to me about these uh, scriptures and different scriptures that go along with it. And I realized that I was so mediocre. I was so uh, humbled by the fact that God would choose me one day that he would forgive me. No, I was not of the elect. As a matter of fact, I was, I was not of the selected one. I was trouble on top of trouble. And I knew I did not deserve God's mercy. And this woman realized the same thing. No doubt she thought, I had nowhere else to turn. No, I'm not of the house of Israel. No, I'm not of that select, elect group. And no, I don't deserve his mercy. But I'm going to do it anyway. The devil will tell you, saints of God, and you that are listening online, the devil will tell you, that you, you don't deserve it. God does not accept people like you and me. He wants you to believe the fact that, that you don't have to be, uh, you, 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 you don't have to humble yourself. He'll tell you any lie that you'll believe to keep you off your knees and humble before God. That's the devil's business. That's what he's out to do. He's out to destroy kill, steal, and destroy. He's out to, to tear down. He's out to tear down the kingdom of God to keep you out of his kingdom. And believe me, I am the least of the least. But God, God seemed fit to have mercy. Jesus answered and said, Oh, woman, you're going to make me do something that is completely out of my dispensation right now. But I'm going to have to reach into a whole new diff different dispensation of time. And I'm going to have to pull you out of miracle. Uh -huh. Woo! Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. This is worship. This is what worship will do. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. When you go into the house of God and you plan to worship God, uh, let me tell you, friends, anything can happen. Right. You, have, you got God at your fingertips when you're worshiping him. Amen. Yeah. Ooh, I love worship. I love worshiping God. I love coming to church and getting into the song service and yes. getting into the uh, uh, praise service and, and feeling after him. Yes. There's something about feeling after God in the church service that just moves me beyond being moved. Uh -huh. Woo! Uh -huh. To feel that power of the Holy Ghost, to know that he is real and that he can touch me down deep inside, down to the mire of my bone, and stir me beyond stirring. Woo! Hallelujah. Mm. Praise the name of God. <laughs> now, I titled this lesson, there will be crumbs in the master's table, and there will be. The crumbs is not always, you know, what we call, you know, when I sit down at the table to eat, believe me, there's crumbs everywhere. I'm, <laughs> I'm just a sloppy eater. Uh, sometimes I think I just need a bib. But uh, there will be crumbs. You're going to sit down at the table and eat. You're going to have crumbs. But Jesus said that he couldn't take his bread that was intended 
for the house of Israel. And he could not throw that to the dogs. He couldn't just cast that aside. Because that was not what it was intended to be. You see, they first had to bring this to Israel. The Jews first. And then the Gentiles. We're included in this, but not right now, as, it, as the scriptures read. So, the woman told, and I, I've got other scriptures, I'm just, I just want to make sure I get all this. The woman told Jesus, well, I understand, and no, I do not deserve any of the children's bread. I don't deserve that. I'm not of that elect group. But you know, I would be satisfied and I would be happy with just one crumb. How much power that there is in somebody that can take one crumb off a big loaf of bread. How much power is in that faith of that individual that can say, just give me the crumb. Just give me that crumb. That's all I need is just a crumb. Because I believe you. I believe that you can do it. Even if, even if everybody else is negative. Everybody else is, is gainsaying and saying, no, it can't be. Give me that crumb. And I'll build faith on that. There will be crumbs. That's one thing we can be sure of. Man, there may not be a whole loaf of bread waiting for us, but there will be crumbs that will fall to the, off the table and that we can reach and get and be satisfied and miracles can happen and we can build on that faith and we can walk in the newness of life just because we were willing to take the crumb. Yes, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Uh, I hope that Pastor can keep up with my uh, jumping around on these scriptures. Because, you know, when you, when you study the Word of God, you know, you'll find one thing that fits, and then you'll go back and read it, and then it don't fit no more, and then you got to find yeah. something else. <laughs> or you got to look for something else. And my, sometimes I, I'll send him my scriptures, and <clears throat> and I might change something before I get here. So if it's not his fault, if it's not up there. Okay? So Matthew 22nd chapter. <clears throat> I was talking about the wedding banquet, the parable that Jesus had related to them. <clears throat> and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by a parable and said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant, and the remnant took his servant and entreated them uh, spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and buried and burned up their city. I'm sorry. Then said he to his servant, "The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy." Go ye therefore into the highway, as many as ye shall find, and bid to the marriage. So the servant went out into the highway and gathered together all, as many as they found, both big, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. The wedding banquet. Jesus is using a parable to get a point across about the Jewish house 
and the Gentile race of people. Now, I am a Gentile, but I am a spiritual Jew. Okay? So Jesus, or the parable goes that the kingdom of heaven was as a, a king preparing a banquet for his son's wedding. He called all the royal dignities, all the dignitaries, and he said, come. Come to the marriage supper. Come on. We're having a, I got all the, the, the food is prepared. I got the oxen and the fatlings are all killed and prepared, and we want you to come and, and enjoy this beautiful celebration. Well, they didn't, they couldn't come, or they wouldn't come. They realized that they were too busy. They didn't want to mess with that. They, they had other things to do. They had other irons in the fire or whatever crusade you want to want to call it. They were too busy. They didn't want to go. They didn't want to take the time to go. So we find that the king was wroth and he realized what was going on. He caused a big ruckus and he went and he killed a bunch of them, burned their cities and destroyed everything. But he still had no guests. He didn't have the dignitaries. He didn't have nobody that could come to the wedding banquet. And he needed guests. He needed them. So he told his servant he should go out the highways. Go out to the byways and gather them together. Anybody. Don't matter who they are. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? He said, don't matter who they are. If they're a bunch of slums, a bunch of bums, a bunch of do-gooders, a bunch of bad people, whoever it is, go get them, bring them in, let them eat. You know, I thought about that. <laughs> and, you know, I was the one that they sent out to find in the highways and the byways. I was not a big dignitary. I was not of that high class. I was not of that sect of people. But yet, they sent out and they found me and I was at the very lowest. I probably went out and they probably found some guy that was half blind, bald headed, no shoes, tattered clothes, dirty, smelt bad, had flies circling around his head, had that weird look on his face. Said, we want to invite you to the wedding supper. And he, the old boy with the flies circling around his head and his finger in his nose and picking his nose and just as gross as he could be. And I, Me? I'm not allowed inside there. I can't go into the king's marriage supper up. Oh, well, look at me. And sometimes, you know, I find myself saying I'm not worthy of going to the Lord's house. I'm not worthy of my need to God. I'm not worthy to, to be there. But yet, I imagine in my own mind, when I first came to the Lord and I, I, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I got up from there and I thought, man, I have got a pot of gold here. Yeah. I have got something that I did not work for. I did not even know was possible. But here it is. I'm forgiven. I, I've been redeemed. I, I have been bought for, by a price, and, and I, I don't have to uh, do anything anymore. I'm saved. Right. Well, I, I was in a saved condition. Right. We're all in saved condition. Yes. Until we get on the other side, yes. then we can say, hallelujah, we made it. Right. Yeah. But until we get there, we've got to work on us. We got to work on our bodies, on our on our uh, active attitudes, and we got to continually, as Paul said, die daily unto this flesh. We got to bring it under subjection. 
We got to make sure that we're walking accordingly to the Word of God. And that's how that we make it to the other side. That's how we're going to make it to heaven. We're not going to make it just because one day, 40 years ago, I bowed a knee and an altar of prayer and, and boo-hooed a little bit and got up and, and never gone to church doors again. That's not how you get your life straightened out. You must work on everything that we do. You got to work every day. It's not... Uh, it's not a bed of roses all the time, but it is a joyful time serving God. We struggle and we fight against flesh. We struggle and we fight against life in general. We blame things on the devil that's really not him, but he's glad to, to take the blame. You see, what I'm saying here tonight is that we are ever, always struggling against the flesh and that we must always walk accordingly to the Word of God. So it was. The king said, go out to the highways and the byways. Just find anybody. I need anybody. I need somebody that will come to this banquet. I'll let anybody in. Amen. I'm telling you, God uh, is not a respecter person when it comes to serving him, when it comes to, to getting in this great New Testament church. Uh, anybody can come. Anybody can bow knee to him. He will forgive, and he will forget, and he will set you on a road of holiness and let you walk accordingly. Amen. And he will be there. Amen. That individual that was come walking into that banquet, tattered clothes, dirty face, filthy. He walked in and he said, Wow, I always wondered what it looked like in here. Wow, look at all that gold and silver and all that beautiful stuff. Look at all these great glorious things. Well, I, I never thought in my entire life that I'd ever see that flies flying around his head. It's not rolling down his face and he's just thinking, wow, think, just think, a guy like me in a place like this. Yeah. Well, that, that's a little humor, but It is accordingly similar to what it is when you come to the kingdom of God, when you come to God. You didn't deserve to come. You weren't merited. You didn't do anything. You didn't do nothing to deserve this. But yet, Jesus went to the cross and he gave his life's blood that you could have have this more abundantly. Have it. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. It doesn't matter uh, anything. Jesus said, I, I'm going to die for the world. I'm going to die for the world. I'm going to give my life's blood that every man, woman, boy, and child can have an opportunity to be saved. I've got quite a bit of ground to cover. <clears throat> I uh, better move on. Acts 13, again at verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next... Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas whacked bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. He's 
talking to the Jewish people. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You see what's building here? The banquet, the wedding banquet, they turn to a lesser group of people. Paul and Barnabas were preaching. They knew they had to preach to Israel first. They knew they, knew they had to offer it to them first. But since they have rejected it, since they have turned away from it, since they did not want to accept this, Paul and Barnabas said, we turn to the Gentiles. For so had the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentile, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Yes, the Gentiles, they were very happy. Very, very happy. Because, you see, to fulfill the scriptures, fulfill prophecy about Jesus, they first had to preach this gospel to the Israelites. First they had to preach it to them. And then when Paul and Barnabas come on the scene, that's why Jesus told the woman, it's not meant for me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. It's not time for you to get a miracle yet. I must first preach to the Jewish people. Must first offer it to them and then to the Gentiles. I'm not doing too bad. So in 1 Peter 2 and 10, and these are just scriptures to uh, reiterate what we've been trying to tell or, or relate to you about the difference. Let's skip up to uh, verse 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Peter 2. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Man, we are of a group of people that we have obtained mercy because Jesus said that he'd come to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's me. That would have been me. I, let's see. I don't know if I can get to this or not, but I'm going to try. Romans 11th chapter. In my Bible, yeah. Romans 11, 17 through 24, and I'll close after this. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Now the olive tree is, is Israel. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boastest, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Grafting is when you 
put something within a tree that, that it will gain life and that it would sprout again. Uh, my dad used to do some, uh, some of these things. I remember, I don't know why he done it, but it, I couldn't explain to you why he was doing these things, but he would take uh, a branch that was broken off and if he wanted it on another fruit tree, he would take that and be the same type of fruit tree, but he would take it and he would cut a notch in that tree and he'd put that in that tree and he'd tie it up and wrap it up and he'd just leave it there and then, uh, the, the following year there would be just a little bit of sprouting on that. It'd start to grow. And it, grafting means that it's, uh, not, it's not really supposed to be there, but it, it made it. It was there. It worked. Okay. I'm trying to hurry here. Uh, verse 20, well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. And what what we want the point that we wanted to make here and make make a make it a little shorter was that uh, we as Gentiles, once we come to God and we repented and we're filled with the Holy Ghost and we become a spiritual Israelite. In other words, we become the spiritual side and the Jewish uh, people that did not accept Christ when he was here on earth, they are the natural uh, church of, of God. They only believe that there's, uh, that Jesus was not their Messiah. They, they, they did not believe that, but uh, because they didn't accept him, we were allowed the plan of salvation. Amen. And thank you for listening to me. I hope you got something out of this. And take it home with you. Study it for yourself. And many, many scriptures relating to this topic. Uh, it will take another hour to get it all out, but amen, we, we're done tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Pulliam. And God bless each and every one of you tonight. Wonderful lesson from the Word of God. Yes. And I was just thinking as he was preaching the Word about the woman of Canaan, and the Lord began to speak some things into my spirit. And I thought, well, I might just do what Brother Ryan did this past weekend. He just took the scriptures I preached last week, and he preached from this week. And the Word of God's full, isn't it? It is. It is. You can go back to the same scriptures, and there's so much more there each time we look at it. And the Lord will speak to us what we need for that time. And I thank the Lord for speaking to us what we needed tonight. Amen. Let's stand together. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight. And thank you, Brother Pulliam, for preaching the word of God to us.